Okay. Okay.
Okay. So let's review a couple of things that we saw in that video and try to clarify them. First of all, up on the right-hand data projector, we have a vertical view of a cyclone. And notice here we've got the circulation of counterclockwise winds about the central eye. Now that eye is a region of low pressure. And so high pressure tends to move in toward low, but because of the Coriolis forces, it's deflected so that it moves round and round in a circle. Looking at it from a side view, we have the high pressure regions on either side of the low. And so the air then tends to move in from high to low. And so normally, what would happen is that this air would tend to cool as it moves from uh, high to low. Uh, but uh, we have evaporation. And so evaporation takes the most active molecules from the ocean and delivers them into the cloud. And so this air then uh, stays at a relatively constant temperature, even though this motion from hot to cold would normally be a cooling because of the fact that the low pressure area tends to be cooler than the high pressure air mass. But this additional influx of heat from the evaporation is the engine which drives this cyclone. And so then the motion of the winds circulates about the low as the air rises. And so the natural tendency then for the rising air as it goes to higher elevation is to expand and cool. But we have yet another source of energy which is condensation. And so condensation of the water vapor releases energy. And so as it rises, it continues to heat. So the cloud is getting warmer, even though there's this tendency of it to cool off as it goes from high to low. We have that compensated for by the evaporation. But then as the air rises, we have more energy being delivered into the system when our water vapor becomes liquid. So when it condenses, this releases energy, lots of energy. This is called the release of energy from a phase change. And so this phase change from gas to liquid is the reverse of what happens when you evaporate something from liquid to gas. And so uh, uh, what we have then is a influx, an additional influx of energy from the latent heat energy of the gas as it's converted into liquid. And so the temperature up here is higher than at the ground. And so this air then rises, the temperature gets hotter, but then it radiates energy when it gets to this higher point. And it cools and it drops back down, and then it starts the cycle again. But since we're gaining a little bit of heat each time that it moves up through this, what we call the eye wall here. And 
This is on either side. This means that the circulation of air can start moving faster. And as the air around the eye wall starts moving faster, that causes the low pressure region to get even more intense. So it gets to be a stronger low with faster moving wind velocities. And so this is how the um, intensity of the cyclone grows. With enough evaporation, which happens with high enough temperature water, what we get then is a heating during each cycle. So each cycle makes the cyclone more intense. which means higher wind velocities and a lower low. If we look back up at the data projector, we can see a model for a particularly large hurricane in which the air is moving in, it's moving up in this kind of a process, but then it shows the outflow of the air, and it also shows that there's a possibility for the air to rise in these little subcells as well. And so there's some evidence that large enough hurricanes can also get a bunch of these little mini hurricanes happening around the central one. However, if you look at the same hurricane from a top view, we see that the main feature of low pressure is here. And so we don't see a lot of the structure that is associated with those smaller eye wells and those smaller uh, uh, <coughs> the, the smaller upwellings. However, we can see that in a rainfall chart. We can see that there is some indication that uh, there can be a rising and a swirling pattern of air happening in local low pressure regions that surround the central region. But this generally will only occur for very, very large cyclones. And uh, so typically from uh, a satellite, we're more likely to just see a single one and not see as much structure in these rings which would be associated with these smaller lows. So, in summary, we can see that this is a powerful and dynamic effect in which uh, the energy in one cyclone that is large can be greater than the entire energy output of the United States over the same period of time. And this is only going to increase as the ocean temperatures get higher. Due to climate, uh, global climate change.
So an increase in the temperatures of the oceans is, as we'll see in a future lecture coming up soon, is uh, not only going to melt the glaciers, which will cause the sea levels to rise and, and flood uh, coastal communities all over the planet. A good portion of Florida may go underwater, as well as uh, uh, areas of Holland, uh, Venice, Italy. Uh, they're all, and then some uh, island nations in the Pacific, the islands are, are likely to go completely underwater. But we're also, for the remainder of the land which stays above the levels of the increased ocean level, we're going to have uh, killer storms. Uh, and in addition to that, the temperature in the land masses will rise, and so that means that tropical insects will start to move to higher elevations and carry diseases with them. For example, mosquito-borne uh, malaria, that sort of thing will uh, increase as the uh, global temperature continues to rise. So this is something that we need to not only be aware of, but know how to fight against it.